Okay, this is Mike once again. Welcome back to part two of the governmentality lecture. Uh, getting right into it. So we finished the last video about um, or getting to the point where we're where we're looking at the art of government. Now, to formulate this art, to make this art come into existence, you gotta know what you're dealing with, who you're dealing with. And I say no in Foucault's idea of knowing or knowledge. So all of these tactics and strategies increased to produce knowledge about individuals, um, about the local offices, about all the little mini governments we were talking about. Um, everything that could possibly be counted and categorized would eventually become what we call statistics. And uh, notice the word state in the word statistics, um, because that's exactly what uh, what it was and what it was uh, and who it was for. Uh, it was a way of producing knowledge on behalf of the state. But these same statistics actually help create and modify the state. It helped uh, constitute the art of governing the state. At this point. At this point in the text, he explains why the art of government kind of had trouble um, taking off earlier than when it actually did. Um, so there were crises that prevented uh, a focus on the art, um, but there were also some, uh, some attempts to get into this art of government, like mercantilism. Uh, even though it was focused on creating wealth, um, it was still too focused on creating wealth for the sovereign um, and making the sovereign more powerful. That was still the priority. Uh, those priorities ten are, are, go are gonna shift. Um, additionally, we are figuring out that uh, the sovereign model is kind of too abstract and too mystically big to actually control an entire population of people. At the same time, the family model, the economy model, doesn't really provide um, guidance as to how to control a state either. So from the family model, we get the idea of surveillance and control. Um, but the father and the household is too simple to apply to an entire state. So. With statistics, we have information about the population. We're knowing the population. It allowed for some level of surveillance and control. So we start seeing a shift from the meaning of economy from being about the family uh, to now being about the population. So this is an economy model that takes as its object the population instead of the family. Now, uh, an economy based on population gives us what we can call the economic. And we notice this is closer to the modern idea of economy, although it's not exactly the same. Um, at, now, at this point in history, we had already been developing statistics. Uh, but we started realizing uh, the more and more uh, statistics we have, the more we can know things like regularities, like death and birth rates, like crime rates, etc. The family itself uh, now becomes a unit located within the population, which also uh, is another place where we can gather statistics. Um, and these statistics are particularly useful to the art of governing. So even though the family is no longer the model of governing, uh, producing stats on the family becomes one of the best ways to produce uh, tactics of governing, to produce strategies. So the family becomes a very important instrument uh, to governmental surveillance and control over population. Um, and being so absolutely integral to the art of governing the state, the family would, would itself take on 
variations of these tactics to better govern itself as a family. So population becomes the purpose of the art of governing. Uh, population and what we now know of as the economy is what the government needed to focus on to govern rationally or to govern effectively. So notice at this point, it becomes far more difficult to establish the legitimacy of a single sovereign power, a, a, a singular prince, where the king is like, I'm basically a divine figure and control everything and each and every one of my subjects and my territories and all my subjects must submit to me and my will. Um, you can see that all these strategies and tactics, sometimes purposeful, sometimes accidental, begin to appear not actually in the sovereign's ability to control all by himself as a single person. A lot more goes into governing um, than just sovereign power. A lot more than just the prince's power. The art of governing appears more effective by providing more control and more surveillance all the way down to each individual and family that make up that population. So now, finally, we see the emergence of governmentality. All these new techniques and strategies and tactics, all to better govern, uh, all to better govern the population. That becomes the unit of analysis, the aim and the purpose of governing, the aim and purpose of the art of government. Government re gov governmentality requires that its powers and mechanisms of security and surveillance be dispersed everywhere in all parts of life because the goal is to create a healthy society healthy individuals all of who whom make up the healthy population so the state is is refashioned not purely as top down power it's dispersed throughout and works just as importantly from the bottom up now, lots of scholarship focuses on the state as this monolithic power that takes away rights and enforces laws. Foucault's saying, yeah, but that's really only one, one way to see power or to conceptualize power out of many, many complicated ways to govern. Most provocatively, though, I think, is he suggesting that this might not even be the most important way to govern. The top-down, the sovereign power, the sovereign government might not actually be the most important thing to focus on. Now, if that's true, we have a major problem to any and all scholarship in theory that focuses on top-down power or assumes top-down power is the most important kind of power. So, I hope I translated that text well for you. It's a pretty damn hard chapter, um, especially when you start getting that feeling, oh my god, Foucault, just get to the fucking point. Everybody thinks that. It's cool. Um, read it a couple times, and check out those two translations. Uh, if you're having trouble with the Foucault effect, switch over to the lecture version. Uh, I really think the lecture version is just a little bit easier, but at the same time, the Foucault effect will drop these like singular sentences in there that clarify the lecture um, that are missing in the lecture, or maybe they're added over here. I don't know if they're missing. So both of these help each other. So if you're a super nerd, read both of them side by side, like I did. So. I'll see you guys around. I'm Mike Mena once again. Um, Till next time.